good afternoon all we have the new year approaching happy new year when it comes for you and um, I'm glad that many of you enjoyed the recent spreadsheets of my videos of the last three uh, and a bit years one of the most um, favorited video was when I was I wasn't a YouTube partner so the video was only about 11 minutes restrained by length and there were many variations of a particular game which maybe could have been explored and so I want to take the opportunity to give you a final gift video for this year by trying to do this game um, in an instructive and ent entertaining fashion. I hope I'm not going to bore you with variations too much, but I do want to cover more than my original video of this game. So the game that I want to end this year with for videos is the game of the century, nicknamed by Hans Mock in Chess Review. So this was played by Bobby Fischer who's now passed away of course. He was 13 year, years old at this time. It was played in the Rosenwald Memorial Tournament, New York City, October the 7th, 17th, 1956. So his opponent was Donald Byrne, who was actually a, a brother of a grandmaster, Robert Byrne. And I think many people um, are confused. Sometimes they say that uh, as though Donald Byrne was a grandmaster. I don't think he actually had the grandmaster title. He was an international master. His brother Robert was a grandmaster and also suffered some brilliant games in the hands of Fisher uh, in the years to come. Now Fisher, when he was 13, this is 1956, curiously it wasn't included, it, at least in my version of the Fisher 60 Memorable Games book. That starts from 1957. So this is really before Fisher got onto the, um, the major roadmap of winning uh, you know, US championships time after time. Uh, but showed how dangerous he was at the age of 13. So nowadays we have loads of dangerous juniors on the rating system, learning, of course, from all sorts of resources, getting very strong. We have grandmasters appearing before the age of 16. But at that time, in 1956, it was unheard of to have juniors this strong and beating you know, international masters um, or grandmasters. So this, this was the start of Fisher's journey. For a fantastic uh, career ahead. Now, I want to take a particular perspective on this game because the game's been annotated and analysed um, many, many times by many, many people. So, I thought, what can I offer of unique value as well as exploring some variations and ideas? I thought actually we could take a recent angle of interest, uh, namely strategic crush versus playing the position. And I think it's quite appropriate, really, for this game, because I think Fisher was a very precise player. Many grandmasters have commented how precise his calculations were. The clarity, we call it clarity, I think, that's the word, of variations is amazing. And in Fisher's memorable game books, one wonders, did he actually see all those variations documented? Well, Larry Evans apparently helped in that book, uh, which this game wasn't included, but, you know, there's many, you know, deep deep variations and one wonders really did he see all of those with such precision okay so could we say that often Fisher was a play the position player yes I believe he was one was one of the most accurate uh, grandmasters of his generation one of the best ca you know variation calculators combining that with great positional awareness and great end games of course great middle game and great opening theory. In the openings he played, he knew with great depth. You know, like the Sicilian Nidorf, the King's Engine. Okay, let's get into the game. But with this perspective, as I say, that's why I want uniquely to try and add for this annotation, this version, which I've already annotated in the past, as I say, in a short 10 minute version. Let's get into it now. So Donald playing white kicks off with Knight F3, the Retty opening, unassuming. And, you know, maybe if black played uh, c5, he could transpose it into a Sicilian defense. If Fisher played c5, there'll be an option for white to either play it like English opening or even make it a Sicilian defense. So actually, though, Fisher elected for another flexible move, not committing pawn structure at all, knight f6. And now white sets the nature of the game up by playing c4, which is like the English opening trying to control d5 and often the bishop would be fianchettoed here in the English opening but will it be 
like that treatment with the Fianchetto, or will white play a different setup? We're about to find out. Now here Fischer played actually G6. So this is more exciting than a symmetrical English. Okay, so G6. As though he, he's keen to go into his favourite King's Engine defence. Now Fischer, remember, is only 13. He, his knowledge of opening systems wasn't that great. And in fact, he shielded himself from the wrath of much opening theory and preparation by often playing things like the King's Engine attack as white, which is like a coiled spring setup with G3, Bishop G2, D3, against things like the Sicilian or French. He'd avoid mainstream theory. It was only later, you know, he started reading and digesting more. And, you know, he even learned Russian to, you know, pick up theory from Russian chess magazines. He started playing much more sharp openings later. But at 13, his repertoire was extremely limited. So heading for the King's Engine, Donald Byrne must have thought, well, you know, I want to surprise the kid, maybe, if we try and have some empathy for this game and the circumstances, that he wanted to surprise Fisher by not going into the King's Engine. So after Bishop G7, Okay, it looks as though King's Indian territory is about to appear after d4, Fisher now castled, and one would expect e4, and then Fisher would be at least reassured he knows something about the position. He knows a lot of King's Indian um, games, at least. But remember, he's only 13, so this, this would have been what we would call a comfortable position, maybe. So maybe this was an idea now to get rid of Fisher's comfort zone. The experienced international master Donald Byrne maybe thought, OK, I, I don't want Fisher in the comfort zone of his King's Engine defence. So what I'll do instead is Bishop F4. Now that's that looks like a sort of London system, except the London system is a pawns on C, on C3 and D4. And the bishop will be blunted by a pawn triangle. OK, but with C4 already in play, this is more aggressive in some other respects that the bishop can, can sometimes usefully, if black played d6, and say the bishop was tucked over here on, on h2, sometimes c5 is a very useful strike to strike at these two squares. So there's queenside pressure, potentially. So the big question is here, does Fisher want a fixed um, f structure or a fluid structure? Or does he, in fact, want to play it like um, to try and open up the centre later and not really have a centre to attack? OK, so the question is, d6 or something else? He actually chooses something else, d5. And it signifies a transposition now into the Groonfield defence. The Groonfield became very popular after Kasparov. He was getting uh, rolled over in his first match against Karpov years later in a World Championship match. And um, he switched from the Tarash, who he had a few losses against Karpov, uh, avoiding isolated queen pawn issues and, and, and general counterplay removal. And he switched to the more dynamic, kind of hyper modern ish Groomfield. Still like the King's Engine, but um, no major structural weaknesses like the Tarash. So the Groomfield is used by Grandmasters like Svidler this year a lot. He's one of the leading exponents of 2700 Grandmasters. It's a dynamic opening system. It's a viable alternative to the Slav defence. In some Super Grandmaster tournaments this year, this has been the opening of choice, more popular than, than the ever increasingly popular Slav defence. So d5, we see now the choice by white, queen b3, which is the Russian system. So some of the ideas of the Russian system is to encourage black to release the tension in the center with d takes c4 and try and maybe gain useful tempo on the white queen. So d takes c4 is very tempting to try and kick the queen around. But in practice, often the queen will kind of return back to c2 and white will still have these two center pawns intact usually. OK. Now a passive move like c6 is is not really that dangerous for white here. If white can play, say, e3, white will have a solid position with pressure on b7, a very pleasant position, being able to recapture with the bishop maybe later. OK, so Fisher takes the opportunity to potentially harass uh, the white queen. He instead, instead of c6 or anything else here, he plays d takes c4. So in terms of strategic crush 
from Donald Byrne's perspective. The strategic crush White is aiming for is better central control, pressure on the Queen side, pressure on the semi-open C file. We've got a semi-open C file here. Okay, Black's got a semi-open D file with pressure on D4. So Black's plans, if we look at the semi-open files, are more like evidence that moves like Bishop G4 and maybe later sometimes c5 in the Greenfield is typical but in this particular position of course c5 is really ruled out that's another benefit of the queen on c4 at the moment just be taken by the queen but usually bishop g4 at least is featured in most Greenfields, and here it's going to be playing a useful role so trying to intensify pressure on d4 at the very least but black was also faced with the semi open c file uh, pressure. He wants to make use of his trump card's positioning in terms of structure, semi open D file pressure, and neutralize White's trump card, which is semi open C file pressure. So his next move, as well as uh, making the pawn not uh, um, pre, it neutralizes a bit for the moment the semi open C file pressure that White has. And maybe also the C6 pawn is useful for later B5 and potentially B4. Of course, it also supports d5, so maybe knight b6 later to d5 could be useful. So there are a few benefits of playing c6. Another interesting idea, if, if black wants to play very sharply and make this into a gambit, is in fact to, 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 to sacrifice the c-pawn. Say bishop e6, the very much I checked out before. And this gambit might not be so bad if black gains significant pressure. But okay, Fisher's not wanting uh, to make this into a gambit, which might be quite unsound. So c6, it seems good to play this, but uh, the, the advantage of the Russian system, strategically, strategic crush, has White got a really good position here? Yes, White has got a slight advantage here, in theory, because it's difficult to really prove uh, that the White Queen is offset by the advantage of these two pawns in the center. This system remains quite popular even nowadays, this, this Russian system. Okay. Um, if we take some alternatives to try and harass the queen here, a basic option, say bishop e6. Let's have a quick look at bishop e6, trying to play the position versus the strategic crush which is faced. Now, Queen e2 or queen d3. Queen d3 is probably one of the best. You see a slight, slight advantage for white here in the variations from an engine point of view. Another attempt to harass the queen. Stop that one. Knight h5 harassing the bishop. Put the bishop back. And we're still left with an intact pawn center. So that's one of the things. You, you put up with a little bit of harassment usually in this variation and you, you, you maintain this intact pawn center. That's the strategic crush angle afforded by the system. Okay. Anyway, so bishop e6 wasn't chosen here. Knight bd7 was chosen by Fisher. So potentially there's a knight b6 to harass the queen. It seems far, le far less likely for e5 in the circumstances here, unless knight h5, maybe to kick the bishop off the diagonal, and then e5 might be also afforded by this knight bd7 move. Okay, now White's next move doesn't rush to castle. A, a move which might be quite prudent, say bishop e2 and just castle to connect the rooks. Hello, hello, connection made. And then work maybe on plowing down the c-file anyway, you know, say move like b4, b5 later to coordinate pressure on the c-file with both rooks happy that they're in contact. That sort of prudent move might be great in this position. But um, here actually Donald maybe goes a bit crazy about a positional binds, thinking I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suck out all the life of my opponent's position, make sure there's no chance, even a glimmer of hope for any strategic break in the center. So I'm going to play this positionally sadistic move, ruling out e5 even after knight h5 is might might kick the bishop away from e5. All ruled out. c5 and e5 ruled out. Laughing maybe at this move c6 that that really doesn't afford any breaks in the center. And so much for White's 
Theoretical weakness in the groom field of the d4 being weak. It's fully supported here. So celebrating that support with the rook as well. OK. Now Fisher is not completely depressed from a strategic perspective here. He has the potential for drumming up counterplay at the moment. And um, he kicks off actually with knight b6. Now if we're brutally honest here about black's position, actually it does seem uh, fairly passive without the strategic breaks in the centre being ruled out. So this does seem to be in the realm of tactics. But juniors have not got the experience usually of pawn chains and thematic breaks that you get. That kind of strategic expertise and pattern uh, knowledge comes with experience of game after game. You start to see patterns. You start to see common strategic crushes. So here, the knight b6, it seems, without strategic pawn breaks. Black is playing without strategic pawn breaks in mind. The game um, is, is going to be, ideally, from the junior perspective, more tactical to beat someone with more strategic experience. So knight b6 attacking the queen. And here the normal prudent choice, a good adjective for such moves which express caution in the face of potential tactical wrath. Another way might be prophylaxis. Just to stop any tactical wrath, a prudent move here against knight b6 would be to move the queen back. Let's have a look. Just moving the queen back, would that have been so bad for white? Or just the way, you know, just queen b3, for example. Queen b3 with the idea that if it's harassed again, maybe queen c2 will do here. Here's a variation I saw earlier. So say queen b3. Harassment again, OK. But remember, no strategic breaks here for black at the moment. Queen c2. And white would remain with a small, tangible and lasting advantage if he can get castled and do something with the centre later. OK. And if there is, this bishop is also a tactical vulnerability here. If it's attacked, the knight's on the rim there. Is it dim? Again, white would be left with a small, nagging advantage. So that would be the prudent, cautious approach. Now, juniors are more like play the position rather than strategic crush. And so this next move, which unfortunately reminds myself of a move I played recently, a queen move, subject of potential tactical harassment, uh, basically is a way of exciting juniors that their calculation skills are put to the test. And if they can gain critical tempo by attacking sensitive uh, pieces like the queen, then that could be used to concoct something quite nasty and dangerous. OK. For the moment, it seems that most of the major threats of the Queen are pretty useless and just lose material. If we did an examination of forcing moves available, Black's got this forcing move to attack the Bishop. It's got this one, but that loses a piece, so that's an outrageous one. But we could consider these anyway, because they could highlight tactical vulnerabilities. Is the queen really a tactical vulnerability on c5? Is the bishop a tactical vulnerability? And certainly one would not imagine uh, that this pin is a tactical vulnerability. d4 seems to be fully intact at the moment. So at the moment it seems white's position is pretty secure. But anyway, Fisher does play bishop g4 anyway. It does create a pin on f3 against the rook, whatever that's worth. And now here is what is arguably the most criticised uh, move of the game from white by many annotators worldwide. So again, the more prudent, cautious approach, prophylaxis against uh, counterplay. And many grandmasters, when teaching their students, say to complete development before carrying active operations. It's a golden rule. Why would you complete development before trying to pursue active operations? Well, completing development, part of that is also putting the king into safety. If the king's still on e1 and you try and do active things, the active things you do could rebound on you. That's the problem. Uh, so, you know, you have to be ready uh, to go on the active, um, you know, attacks. You have to make sure you have, no, uh, you have no weaknesses just lurking there to be exploited. So the more prudent approach of bishop e2 in castles would be that principle of completing development, putting oneself beyond defeat before going on to the attack. A basic principle of the art of war, 
one could argue. The number one principle. So anyway, White in this case did seem to do an overly active move before putting himself beyond defeat. He leaves his king in the centre of this move for one more move by playing this move, bishop g5. From a strategic crush point of view, okay, black without strategic breaks. It looks as though this looks like a nice pattern and coordination on e7, as though that might be another useful bind consideration. Maybe even e5 in the future being a threat. So maybe trying to cause some sort of panic that e5 is a threat. But remember, white's king is in the center. Is white really trying to play anything active with this move? Is white really trying to try black to e7? I suppose from one perspective, it, it, it justifies the queen a bit more being on c5. The queen is eyeing e7 after all. Okay. But now we have a real shocker move. And I wonder if you can guess it. Now, I guess many of you have seen this game uh, many times before. Uh, but for those of you who haven't, I don't want to spoil things. I'll give you 10 seconds or you may want to stop the video. Okay, starting from now to see if you can guess Fisher's next move here. Starting from now. Okay, knight a4. Wow, this could have been audited as a forcing move before, but really does it work here? How on earth is this working? What does it do? You might be wondering. Well done if you found this move. It's the reasons though the follow-up which is really important as well as guessing the move though. Now if you saw all of the follow-up then you're a genius. If you saw the move, great, but remember in real chess when you're playing it's the follow-up as well just as important as finding a brilliant move in a particular position. So here, what is going on? What if Donald had just taken the knight? Okay, I don't want to bore you too much, but we need to review some of these variations now because they, they demonstrate finesses of the position. So this is like play the position mode. We're going to have to take the role of a calculator now. So after knight takes a a4, an important forcing move again is knight takes e4, attacking the queen and the bishop. And introducing the threat now, a bishop takes f3, followed by knight takes g5. This is also tactically loose, as this is a tactical tempo gainer. And this, this option to exchange on f3 weakens g5. Okay, in this position, white has not too many options because his queen's attacked. But let's assume queen takes e7. Here's a variation looked at earlier. Check. And now black can play queen takes a4. And this is a really dangerous position for white. Because his king's in the center. There's these rook e8s. So say he plates on e4, rook e8. And it looks as though, whoa, hang on. White rescues the e4 here with bishop e7. That's not the case. After bishop takes f3, assuming white wants to keep hold of the bishop, here and say g takes f3. Pawn structure is, is turning into rubble here, like grandma's teeth. Bishop f8. And okay, Fisher isn't massively up on material, but his material quality is much better. Say rook e7, queen d3. And black is doing brilliantly here. This is a nightmare scenario for white with opposite colored bishops. Say white does manage the castle. Okay, queen takes a2, say. It's not easily punished, this grabbing move. In fact, it's a part of a centralization maneuver. Black has basically a winning position here. Okay, and the, the, the structure is just awful here for white, the pawn structure. But there's a few other variations. So playing the position emphasis, we need to take the role of the calculator. So in this position, after knight takes e4, now let's look at queen c4. Let's rule that out. Just bishop takes f3, as previously mentioned, and knight takes g5. Easy refutation. So that's why the queen hasn't got too many options. In the light of this bishop takes f3, it's important to consider a move like queen c1 to protect the bishop against this bishop f3. So say bishop f3 here. But this check is again dangerous because this knight is now a tactical vulnerability as well. 
So black can afford to just take on d2 and take on a4. And again, we have this horrendous pawn structure scenario where black is just clearly better in this kind of scenario. Terrible pawn structure. Even though opposite colored bishops, black's massively winning. Let's look again. So after this knight takes e4, let's look, is there any other options? Queen c2, again, we would have just takes and takes. So not too many options in this particular scenario. But did we look at queen b4 and queen e7? Queen e7, or bishop takes e7. Let's look at bishop takes e7. I'm not sure we've looked at that one. Just taking the queen here, taking the queen. Now, really powerful check is the most accurate move here. Bishop e2, knight takes a4. Say bishop g5, black's nearly two pawns up from an engine point of view here. So even though, um, okay, three, four, five, six, technically a pawn up, but the structure is again terrible in this scenario. And also d4 is loose. So look at this, for example, rook b1, bishop takes d4. Again, a total wreck for white to avoid. So are you starting to get convinced that in this position, there aren't too many good options? Let's have a look at queen b4. Again, either bishop bishop takes f3 will do here. So really, the, the main option was like queen c1 to consider. Actually, though, technically, Bishop takes f3 might not be as good in this particular scenario, though. Third best move. The actual best move in this particular position, with the bishop and, and queen coordinating still on e7, is actually to take this bishop immediately and play bishop takes d1. So the king is having to recapture. And here, this is crushing from an engine point of view, because d4 is collapsing, for one thing with check. So this is an absolute nightmare scenario for white. So as you see, as I'm hoping is demonstrated by these variations, and I hope you weren't too bored by them, but wherever the queen moves now, it's it's pretty disastrous. Did we did we want to look at anything else? Maybe Queen A three or any other engine engine or possibility afforded if if Fisher had been playing Houdini. Queen b4, bishop e7, queen e7. We've covered the main ones. Queen a3. This knight takes g5 is preferred instead of bishop takes f3. That's an important note, maybe. That d4 collapsing is often very significant, more significant than trying to play bishop takes f3. If bishop takes f3 was played here, it's actually only, from an engine point of view, only a small advantage for white. It justifies the coordination on e7 a little bit more. So that's an important note, that actually sometimes it's knight takes g5, which is more important than bishop takes f3. Just from a technical point of view, okay. So, so actually Donald did well. In fact, he played one of the strongest moves which engines would recommend. He did very well with his next move. From an engine point of view, what is the strongest move here? If taking a knight is no good, Actually, queen b4 and queen a3 come as the two strongest recommendations above knight takes a4. So what he played is actually Houdini's top choice with only inferior pawn advantage to black. Queen a3 at depth 18 in 2011, Houdini is recommending Donald's next move, queen a3. So the intuition of Donald is not letting him down here. He's realized his sins, that his king is still in the center. He's indulged in active operations before completing development. He should have played with more caution, but in the circumstances, this is one of the lesser evils to play. Queen A3. So Fisher here plays a move which to Groomfield players uh, might seem strange, but it is sometimes played in the initial stages of a Groomfield game in the classical variation where Black is often playing a knight takes c3 move, seemingly strengthening white center with b takes c3. This occurs in some of the more mainstream Groomfield variations. But here, Fisher's intention is really quite uh, 
uh, devastating that actually uh, sometimes to create a truly exploitable weakness you need to transform weaknesses by taking on c3 uh, white center is going to be destroyed in any case it seems after knight takes e4 okay we have the immediate threat now bishop takes f3 and knight g5 as as previous variations has demonstrated but now with d4 being strengthened the other stuff is less relevant you know about winning d4 so how is white center collapsing here well here he, with his king still in the center what is the best move in the game bishop takes e7 was played let's look at some alternatives before going on to the game continuation in fact bishop takes e7 is again one of the top moves well initially it was but then maybe the engine realizes oh blimey king in the center all these variations end up losing it switches to another move <laughs> doesn't want to take on e7 bishop e3 and okay it might be less devastating than the game although fisher is a pawn up but the king might survive to be able to castle kingside here say b5 is a move like bishop e2 possible or is that going to be slayed say a5 can white potentially castle maybe doesn't look as bad as the game continuation which i'm about to show you so that would have been a very cautious approach here it seems of the initial caution now donald is more tempted to snatch material with his king in the center maybe he's depressed by the events of the game he didn't want to retreat the bishop back after all it just he just spent another tempo moving it to g5 why not justify it finally with bishop takes e7 okay so the golden rule of playing actively without completing development is being broken violated the king is in the center the intuition our guts might be telling us something is wrong but it sometimes it's hard work to prove our gut instinct is correct we need to concretely prove our intuition that occurs in many of our games year after year we have a gut instinct our position was better after the game we look at it with an engine an engine will tell us yes you of course you were better here's why often we're just passengers but here we've got to prove that white's king is unsafe can it be proven that this violation of a general principle is going to be punished and punishable okay what does fisher do here a sharp tactical move queen b6 queen b6 okay he's offering an exchange stack okay exchange stacks often emphasize things in the position it's no big deal maybe to lose the exchange here one would would argue because then there's rookie eight still the queen on b6 okay what is it doing from b6 what is it supporting what else was there for fisher here out of interest Queen b6 is not actually given as an engine as one of the strongest moves. Queen d5, Houdini likes, seems more central actually, still offering the exchange sack. So say bishop takes f8, bishop takes f8, the queen in its central position might, believe it or not, still be good here, even taking. So what is going on here? Why can't white just play bishop e2? Knight takes c3. There's no time. So say um, white tries to protect or do anything else. It's pretty devastating with the white king still in the center. It ends up losing horribly bits and pieces. So white's really being slaughtered after this because of that threat of knight c3 among another discovered checks on the white king. So with this central move, that would be very powerful apparently. This is the best move in the position from a theoretical Houdini perspective Queen d5 Queen b6 comes second actually but Queen d5 it looks as though this is good news and say Queen b2 say white avoided the exchange of Queens protecting c3 still rook e8 comes in with great effect and here crunching move simply Bishop f3 Knight g5 and the queen is is playing a very important role in attacking f3 if white tries to castle here i'm sure he'll get blasted with something rook e2 and you see the true power of the queen on d5 here 
this is going into a mating five now. So once Fisher's move totally accurate playing the position? No, he's not a supercomputer. He's a human being. He's a 13 year old kid. But Queen B6 does happen to be one of the strongest moves in the position, naturally offering the exchange up to punish White for the violation of principles of active play before completing development, before getting the king into safety, offering the exchange. Okay, is Donald interested in immediately taking the exchange? No. He plays bishop c4, trying to get castled, finally. Okay, let's have a look here after queen b6, if he had tried to win the exchange. So bishop takes her fate. Bishop takes her fate. Are we going to get a raf on the e-fall? In fact, like the other echo variation, taking on b3 might be really strong here. Again, because of simply rook e8. Stronger than knight takes c3 after rook a1. Just rook e8, keeping a lot of threats like knight c3 going. And this is, this is really bad for white. For example, bishop c4 is given as one of the strongest. And again, the raf on the e-fall starts to unveil with a terrible position for white. Opposite color bishops, but again, a shattered pawn structure, like many of the variations we've seen earlier. Okay, so let's see. Queen b6, the exchange disregarded, winning exchange, bishop c4. Now, another devastating move. Very active, aggressive move. And of course, Zwischenzugs had to be factored in. The weakness of the last move had to be factored in by this next move that Fischer played. And there is, there is a weakness of the last move for sure. Okay, first, let me see if you can guess Fischer's next move if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. So starting from now. Okay. Now, if you guessed rook e8, you were wrong. Now, is there a problem with rook e8, just attacking the bishop? Well, actually, the bishop's protected by the queen, so white can just castle here. And maybe it's not so bad, you know, queen c7, okay, the bishop moves, and not too much harm done for white, even though black might be able to double pawns. It's no big deal. Slightly better for black, but it's not such a huge deal. No, it's not rook e8. That was played here. The strongest move, Houdini approved. Fisher played. Knight takes c3. If we do a weakness of the last move check, surely the knight's just come off c5, which means there's a Zwischenzug available with nothing else. If the queen doesn't want to be deflected from the protection of e7. So there's a few things to check out here. But actually, bishop c5 was the game continuation, trying to tap into that weakness of the last move. But let's go for looking at queen takes c3. So what would happen after queen takes c3? Bishop would be pinned. White can get castled. Black would be significantly up, actually, in this position. Because look at white center. d4 is really bad. The queen's not in an ideal place facing that bishop. Black possesses the e file. Black's better, as well as being a pawn up, very nice looking position. Things like queen f4 would intensify pressure both on f3 and d4. So that's a very, very unpleasant position there. On queen takes c3. So, pouncing on the weakness of the last move, which was knight takes c3, a seemingly stunning move, knight takes c3, but ignored, wasn't taken. Bishop c5. So the weakness of the last move, okay. But now, Fischer throws in a check using his f rook, okay. The king is forced to move now. Of course not bishop e2, he can just rook takes e2. The knight's on e2. So the king is forced to move, which is always unpleasant. And now we're left with the stranded rook. So punishment is being meted out now. <clears throat> okay. Now, this next move is described by many as one of the, the, the more brilliant moves in the game. But what are Fischer's choices here? His queen is attacked. 
There aren't too many choices for black. In fact, it might be the only move here that Fisher played. Um, so first of all, let me see if you can guess Fisher's next move if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, I hope you didn't move the queen. I think you'd just be losing the game if you if you move the queen. There's not too many moves. If you move the queen, queen takes c3 and white's better. Now if you try to counterattack the white queen, white's still better. Bishop takes f7 before um, doing anything else. And this is really, truly horrible for black. If it takes check, this is real trouble for black because of queen b3 check. It's getting pretty nasty. Knight takes e6. Knight takes d4. Horrible check. And white's, white's crushing black. So knight b5 is ruled out. So really, there's not too many choices here. A legal move, one could say, is knight b1 attacking the queen. Queen d3, and again, white's slightly better. Again, this bishop takes f7 comes in handy. Queen c4 check. Here, d5, very tactical. What's going on here, you might ask? Check. Bishop takes b6, crushing. So that d5 made way for queen f4 check there. So there's, there's not too many choices in this position, actually. This is basically, um, as well as being brilliant looking, offering the queen up passively, as, as, as many describe it in this game, what other choices did Black have at his disposal here? He's got a knight and pre on c3. His queen's attacked. There's not too many choices. So he has to play bishop e6. So what is going on here? Now in my original video I didn't really explain something which I should have. Which is basically what would happen if bishop takes e6. There's an attractive uh, smothered mate here combination available. I wonder if you can spot it. If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Weakness of the last move. What is the weakness of the last move if bishop takes e6? Clue, it's in this diagonal. So 10 seconds starting from now, what would you play here with black? Queen b5 check, pounces on the weakness of the last move, goes into a lovely discovered mate pattern. If king e1, queen e2 mate, always we're getting into a, a lovely smothered mate pattern like this. So bishop takes e6 is not possible. In the game, the queen was taken here. And now, okay, what else was there for white? Okay, let's have a look at queen takes c5 as well. Now look at that bishop pinning that pawn to the queen. Weakness of the last move here. Queen takes c5. Bishop takes c3. Black's about a pawn up. Bishop takes, rook takes, pawn up, better position, wouldn't have been the beautiful masterpiece which we see the game unfolding to if queen takes c3. Okay, fireworks, windmills, multiple checks, we're about to see everything set off here. This will parallel uh, New Year's Eve celebrations on the chessboard now after what was played. Bishop takes b6 was played. So we have here, some people are referring to this tactic as the windmill tactic. Another thing to call it is seesaw checks. It's this idea of multiple checks which progressively do damage to the opponent's position or pick up material. So bishop takes c4 check. Bishop's been munched. Check, now a centre pawn drops with check. 
and White is just going back on the seesaw, leaning backwards and forwards on the seesaw in this tactical scenario, which is also called a windmill. So check again, King's again forced to F1. Now Knight C3 check with the option of taking the Rook next, as well as the Bishop. Now here, Fisher decided to take the bishop. Is this the strongest move? I think it would be because it's unveiling an attack on the queen. Knight takes d1, leaves black with a better position as well. Knight e2, well that's our seesawing again. So really the strongest move now is what Fisher played. A takes b6 to uncover an attack on the queen. And you might think, hold on a sec, with this breathing moment, can white queen attack the bishop at least? It does, queen b4. But the bishop can now be protected with tempo again, unfortunately, with rook a4. Oh dear, black's pieces are coordinating like a great team coordinates. So winning now the rook. Ample material has been taken for the queen, passive queen sacrifice. More than enough material. Okay, so <laughs> the white king at least tries to make way for the rook to come into the game finally with h3. But more material is about to be lost. The a2 and f2 pawns say goodbye to them now. After rook takes a, a2, now knight takes f2, the rook being attacked. Does the rook want to go anywhere apart from e1 to try and at least get rid of one of the rooks? It's a pretty miserable position. Out of interest, what is the best technical move here? Engines put this at seven unit advantage for black now. The game's over, the game's been won, basically. But what we're about to see in this final phase is aesthetically beautiful, aesthetically brilliant. And Donald Byrne, I believe at one point, had asked his fellow competitors, what should he do? Should he let the kid mate him? And I believe he made the right choice to immortalize this game instead of resigning here in a clearly lost position where the queen, the queen is fairly helpless. It's not a scenario where the queen and knight have got major tactical vulnerabilities to exploit. The bishop's always protecting f7 here. Black's king is really solid. Black's pieces are active. White's king is very weak here. Anyway, white plays rookie one. So we have here uh, takes, now in this intermediate check, Okay, it pins the bishop, but no big deal. Let's count up material. Assume the, the queen is worth 9 or 10. We've got 5, 8, 9, 10, 11 to balance it out, ignoring these two guys. So black is, is doing well on material. And he now centralizes the bishop, bishop d5, pointing at white's king, of course, giving the option if knight f3 for, for bishop takes f3. Funny enough, this is, the, I think, the best continuation. Instead of bishop f3, keep, keeping the bishop on d5 is, is much stronger. I think this is a much stronger move now, what Fisher played. Knight e4 is one of the strongest moves from an engine point of view. But bishop takes f3, would that be actually letting white off the hook? Not really. Black's still winning in this scenario. It's, it's actually just really a, a dominating position. Because uh, not only we've got these which more than make up for the queen. We've got two connected past pawns here after b5, if nothing else. So this is like nine units up for black in theory, even this position. So it was hopeless here. Uh, lots of moves win, but knight e4 facilitates further coordination of knight and bishop on d6. Once this bishop is unpinned, bishop d6 is going to be a serious threat to get to the white king. So queen b8, keeping the pawn, so just in case he needs this pawn to queen, <laughs> okay, h4, a faint hope of an attack, not really, it's ruled out anyway, h5, the pawn not not going to be used uh, for any aggressive purposes, knight e5, not really attacking f7, it's already protected, things are already protected, there's nothing really loose in black's position, Fisher unpins the bishop now to make way for bishop d6, and the final aesthetic part of the game now, which really immortalizes the game. We have here, instead of bishop d6, which would seem to be useful as well, uh, 
a lovely demonstration of how pieces coordinate. Bishop d6 is, is a reasonable move. There are, there are of course other reasonable moves. Um, you might think, well, can the queen protect the knight? Not really. It's still it's still completely winning uh, f for black. But we now let's just just play the rest of the game. It's a beautiful coordination an orchestration of pieces coming up now. The king is rolled up the board to the a1 square. It's heading in that direction anyway. Check, 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 and we get here the final mate. What can we draw from this game? Okay, some people have summarized this game often saying uh, about the, um, well, Wiki has mentioned the noteworthy innovation in improvisation. Burn playing white after a standard opening makes a seemingly minor mistake at move 11, losing a bit of tempo, moving the same piece twice. Fisher pounced with brilliant sacrificial play, culminating over queen sack on move 17. Burn captures the queen, but Fisher gets far too much material for it. And in the end, Fisher's pieces coordinate to force checkmate. Okay, let's do an overview and summary of the game. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope uh, the variations didn't bore you to tears. I wanted to cover a lot more variations than my first video. So, Groomfield defense, Russian system. Fisher without any strategic pawn breaks, but he's got a queen to harass after this queen c5 move. And the real blunder of the game, bishop g5, moving a piece twice. Now, if you're up against a pesky calculating junior who factors in tiny finesses of the position, they might be playing this sort of move next against you, factoring in that your queen is on c5, a tempo gaining uh, resource wasn't taken there's devastating implications i'll put the pgn in the description of this video if you want to review them with your own pgn viewer the center was seemingly reinforced paradoxically here for a moment only to be crumbling just a few moves later offering up the exchange queen b6 might not be the most technically precise move from an engine point of view but um it turned out to be absolutely brilliant after white tries to exploit the weakness of the last move here, knight takes c3 by pouncing on Fisher with bishop c5. This now means there's not too many options for black, knight b5 and knight b1 to attack the queen. No. Brilliant move instead. Introduces a nasty tactic pretty after this first of all check, this bishop e6. So if bishop takes e6, the weakness of the last move here will be this diagonal, which will be pounced on with queen b5 mating the white king. So, in this position, queen c3 is also terrible because there's a nasty pin on the d-pawn. So queen c5 is possible, leaving black with that position. So, Donald took the queen. He entered the windmill. Lots and lots of checks, picking up lots and lots of material. And the windmill's just interrupted for a moment with a takes b6. Winning the bishop on b6. And still with tempo, still attacking the rook after rook a4, attacking and defending the bishop, offering b6, which is only a double pawn in any case. So still two connected past pawns, just in case uh, Fisher doesn't manage it with his overwhelming material advantage. Uh, he's got two connected past pawns here coming up. Now the final phase of the game, Donald plays on sportingly for his younger opponent, we see a demonstration of King going from one end of the board to the other to be aesthetically mated. Hope you enjoyed that. Happy New Year when it comes. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.